Welcome, everybody, to the Wilds of Eldraine Limited Level Ups Common and Uncommon Set Review. We're back with Neo MTG, aka Mark Anderson. I would say fan favorite, but at this point, it's like Grizzled Set Review Veteran. I can't say fan favorite anymore. I have to give him a new title. Welcome back, Mark. How you doing? Yeah, thanks. Is this, uh, this is a year, is it, that I've been doing these, maybe? Roughly? Almost. Something I like think that. your first one was uh, Phyrexia, which was the beginning of 2023. So one more set, and then you got a full year in there. Okay, yeah, yeah, it's four sets a year. So yeah, we're, we're almost there. Who's counting, though? Yeah, exactly. Who's counting? So for today, we are doing the commons and uncommons. Going to be doing the rares, mythics, and the enchantment bonus sheet tomorrow if you're watching this on Twitch. If you're listening to this or watching this on YouTube, uh, you know, if, it, if there's no rare or mythic uh, video or, or audio just yet, it's coming next 24 hours, I imagine. Unless you're just a complete magic sicko like we are, uh, you won't have listened to the common and common one all the way through, so don't worry, that content is coming. But in the meantime, for today, you know what we're going to go through? All of the commons and uncommons, just like we usually do, starting with the gold rares, or sorry, the gold uncommons, the signposts, just to give us a little bit of a lay of the land, see what each of the color pairs is doing. There are two for each color pair this go around. We're going to be using the tried and true limited resources grading system, and I figure I should shout this out because I know there are some folks that aren't as familiar with this grading system. It's the A to F letter system. Just to run through it very quickly. Your A's, these are your bombs, your game winners, your first picks. These are the cards that are going to you know, be the, the best cards in your deck. Your B's are your active pulls into a color. A, a card that's like, hey, that's a really strong card. Maybe not quite a bomb, but you see this card, you want to take it, you want to draft that color. Your C's, these are, you know, as uh, many people say, the pawns of limited. You're going to play these if they're in your color. You know, you're going to draft them appropriately, middle of the pack. They're not going to be super exciting, but you're going to be happy putting them in your deck. And Mark, I actually like your distinction you often make between uh, like C and C plus. Maybe the distinction isn't right there, but I think often you say C plus is I'm never cutting this card from my deck unless it's like absolutely busted. My deck is busted. But C plus is like, I'm always going to play this card if I'm in the colors, correct? Yeah, there's there's an excellent uh, podcast on this uh, yes. material. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't mean to set you up for that, but yeah, Mark was on talking about tier lists and letter grades uh, a few weeks ago, if you want to check that out. Um, and then your Ds, you know, hope not to play these niche cards. Sometimes you have to make them fit your 20 to 23 playables, and then your Fs are the, the truly unplayables. And one last thing before we jump in, as I want to say, uh, I said this last time, but set reviews, in my mind, the, the most important thing, the most valuable thing you can get out of set reviews is we're really just here to learn the cards, get some initial impressions. By no means do me and Mark think that these are going to be the absolute final grades by the end of the format. There's going to be a lot of toss-up. Just a good way to start a baseline. If Think of it as a way to kind of confirm your own baseline card evaluations, compare, contrast. You know, if you feel like we're completely off on a card, feel free to comment that either in the YouTube comments or in the Limited Level Ups Discord. And right before we jump into our cards, I want to give the Patreon a quick shout out. Patreon.com slash Limited Level Ups. If you like today's show, you feel like you learned something, got you a little more prepared for the coming format, go check it out. It helps really keep the show, keep going, supports the show. There's a bunch of reward tiers over there that we want to give back to you to help you get better at Limited Magic, ranging from coaching to Discord help to deck techs, all that good stuff. Go check it out if you're interested in supporting the show or leveling up your game. I think with all that preamble out of the way, we're just uh, going to get into it. Just once again, the, the ordering, we're going gold first and then colors, Wooburg order, mana value order. So we're going the cheapest things when we get to each color, the most expensive. And let's just jump in here with our first card, blue, white, gold, and common, Sharae of Numbing Depths. So this is two white blue for a legendary creature. It's a merfolk wizard at uncommon. It's a 2-3, so four mana 2-3. And it says, when Sharae enters the battlefield, Tap target creature and opponent controls and put a stun counter on it. Okay, so just for those who don't quite remember stun counters, they uh, have a counter that makes it not untap during the next turn. Then you remove the counter, it'll untap the turn after. It also says, whenever you tap one or more untapped creatures your opponent's control, draw a card. This ability triggers only once each turn. So the sun boast in common for blue white. Blue white is tapping things down. That's That's kind of the name of the game here. Yeah, I was going to start off by asking you, Alex, if you are happy to be back in a plane where people don't know the correct pronunciations of all the names. Oh, I'm, I'm loving it. Yeah, I don't have to, like, stumble over. Chat's not going to make anywhere near as much fun of me for most You've of these cards. You've already into the shambles. You called it Sheree and Sharai. So we're already <laughs> Did I really? Oh, crap. <laughs> I didn't mean to. Anyways, what do you think about the card before we uh, you know, start to lambast me for my pronunciations? I'm sure that'll come after. <laughs> Uh, the card itself looks quite strong, although I do think that the color pair, it's, I know it's a little early to, yeah. to make these judgments, but the color pair is perhaps one that I think might be a little bit unexciting. 
Uh, like, topping things, if you're spending a card to, like, top something, we saw Hithley and Knots from Lord of the Rings be a pretty good card. But I'm expecting the similar type of cards here to not quite be as good. So mm. you really do need probably, like, two of these signpost uncommons to really be worth doing the thing. Right, so just this on its own, how happy, like, say you were just, you know, blue-white deck, not a ton of tapping things. How happy are you with four mana, two, three, comes in, taps, only draw a card? And tap and go all lots down for a turn. I should, I should, uh, you know, specify that. Yeah, uh, really good. Like, I think it's, 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 uh, it's a good card. This might even be a card you, like, splash for in, in other, like, by, by itself, it's still a very good card. And if you, the more tap cards you add to it, the better it's going to be. Right, so blue-white's thing is tapping. There's a lot of cards that just tap things, keep them tapped, and structurally big picture we're talking a tempo deck here right we're not talking a control deck we're talking to have some flyers have some cheap creatures tap your things get in and just not to get too deep into it if you don't want to but any reason you feel like this color combination isn't uh, as strong in your your initial glance at the set um i do think that the the three non the, like the jund colors seem better at, at a glance but again we'll, we'll get into that more later yep uh, the other thing is that the set does seem quite aggressive at a glance, and notably, you only draw the card if you're tapping an untapped creature. Mm, yep. So if you want to lock down something that they've already attacked with, like their biggest thing probably had a good attack the turn before because it's the biggest thing. And so if that's the thing you want to lock down for stun counter for a turn, you're not actually going to draw a card. Right. So let's give this one a letter grade. I'm going to say, and this is a little bit agnostic of where I'm predicting this is going to end up, just the color pair. I'm going to give Shrey... A B. Feel comfortable with that? A B? I was gonna go. I was gonna go B minus. Okay. I think, B yeah. minus is fine. Yeah. I, I think. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll even. Uh, the very first one. I'll, I'll join you. I often do. A, yeah. I'll join you. Or Mark will do the same thing. I think B minus is pretty appropriate. And we'll move on to the next one, which is also a blue white gold card. And it's not exactly the same because now we have da 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 an adventure. So this is our first mechanic of the set. For those who have not played original Eldraine, uh, the adventures are well. I'm sure you've seen them in a lot of cards. But basically, these are instants on half of the card, right? For example, here we've got Rip the Seams, which is Tuna White for an instant adventure, Destroy Target, Tapped Creature, and then the, these are always attached to a creature, the other side of the card, right? We've got a Thread Blind Click. So this one is three and a blue for a three, three flyer. The way these play out are you get to cast the adventure, the adventure creature will then go to exile, and then at a later date, or on the same turn if you have the mana, you can cast this th uh, four mana three three flyer, or you know you don't have to. You can just play out your four mana three three flyer. You don't have to cast rip the seams first. It's just very modular. Adventures are are really good because of that. Basically, they are modular and they're kind of card advantagey, right? If if this all plays out, you're just spending seven mana to get a four four uh, sorry three three flyer and kill a creature. So they tend to be a little bit over costed on each side to make up for the fact that uh, you know you are getting a two for one in a lot of senses, right? And getting some flexibility. So what do you think about Thread Buying Click here as a card? And once again, in the context of Blue White. Another really good one. So it's a good thing when both of your gold uncommons are, are strong, but both of them are also splashable. Like they're, they're all single pips. And with these adventure cards, you don't even need to have both colors of mana right away. Mm -hmm. Like if you're a white deck and the, and both sides are really strong, you can be happy just playing the adventure card, and then you can just leave it sitting in exile for as many turns as you like. And then eventually when you draw your your main color source for this one, you can play the blue side as well. So um, it, it, it does work a little bit with the theme of tapping things down, but I don't think you need to be that deck to play this whatsoever because there's going to be so many tap creatures you can tar target and then just getting a 3-3 flyer for four when it's attached to this is also really strong. Yeah, this is like both sides of this card, the three mana destroy tap creature and the four mana 3-3 three, three flyer. You wouldn't be very happy about those cards just on their own, right? They're like a little bit underrated and even, you know, four mana 3-3 three, three flyers with like a slight ability sometimes underperform. But I do really like this card with, with both these together. I think this one's strong. This one, I would give a B. I think this one, thread by click, I'm going to give a B. Yeah, yeah, adventure. Since it's our, our, we often spend longer on the first cards, yeah. <laughs> uh, talking about the themes a bit more, and that's going to continue here as well. Let me lock in your grade here. But adventures are tricky to really conceptualize if you've never played with before. Uh, even myself, I actually didn't play the first Eldraine set for a lim from a limited standpoint. But it, it's hard to explain just how powerful it is to have the option to either do one or the other or both. Because really, if you're playing that Rip the Seams card, you're adding, like, draw a 3-3 flyer attached to it that can't be discarded or, or interacted with in any way. Right.
Yeah, that's that's something that and you kind of get the, the feel for playing with Avengers after the first honestly the first few games, but it is a little bit uh, stranger here just looking at the card. So uh, one last note I want to make about Thread Blind Click, it's a fairy and fairy is a creature type that is somewhat relevant in this set. We'll get to in a second. All right, next up, Mark, what do we have for our first blue black uncommon? Next, we have Obira Dream Duelist. So this is blue black for a 2-2 legendary fairy warrior. She has flash, she has flying, and whenever another fairy enters the battlefield under your control, each opponent loses one life. Yeah, so this uh, points toward like a blue-black tempo fairy style deck, kind of like the, the deck that was in Standard way back when in Lorwyn. It's like, you know, blue-black controlling tempo, one of my favorite styles of deck. And just like you kind of commented on, on the blue-white color pair, I'm going to comment just quickly here, is that this is a pretty light theme, the actual fairy theme. They, they've actually yeah. said that Blue black is more of a control color pair, and that makes sense because really, when you're looking at the fairy synergies, there's one card in each color, blue and black, at common, and, and you know a handful at uncommon. There's there's actually quite a few good ones at uncommon, so maybe there's more of a uncommon base deck. But don't think you're going to be drafting this card and just every single pack picking a fairy. If you were, this card would be great. I would give this like you know a BB plus or something. That's with that not being the case, two two flash flyer maybe dings your opponent once in a while. It's a little bit more like a C plus. Yeah, that's where I was going as well. And I, I do think that the most relevant ability out of the three listed there is the the flash. Yes. Because you're going to want to play like a bunch of counter spells. You're going to want to play... There's a, there's a bunch of instants that we're, they're going to see. A lot of the adventures are instants. So you really will be playing at instant speed. And having that ability to drop a 2-2 threat that picks away at them is, is going to be the most important thing for this card. Yeah, and don't, don't like, you know, you're playing a control game. Don't be afraid to just run this out on turn two. Your opponent attacks with their 2-2. Two, two. You block if that's something that you feel like is necessary. This isn't some, like, oh, I got to protect Obira. This is, like, going to be my my, my win con. Nah, just trade it off. It's a flexible card. So, C-plus for you as well? Yep. Cool. Next up, we have another fairy here. Spell Scorn Coven. So, once again, this is the adventure for the color pair. Three and a black for a 2-3 flyer. When it enters the battlefield, each opponent discards a card. And the adventure, take it back, is tuna blue for an instant, return target spell to its owner's hand. So spell meaning it has to be on the stack for you to cast this card. Yeah, so really a lot of these adventures in the past have worked well together, set like one sets up the other. Mm -hmm. And this does the same thing because the idea is even if your opponent's empty handed, as long as they don't have enough mana to cast the spell twice, whatever they top deck, you can just bounce it back to their hand and then get it with the discard on, on the backside. Yeah, and then just, you know, on turn three, just being able to go, all right, you play a three drop, I, I effectively bounce that to my hand. And normally that would not be a card you put in your deck, right? Just uh, bounce your spell. That's just not, it's a little bit too narrow. You're losing, it's a bounce spell that doesn't affect things that have already come on board. So, and you're down a card. But of course, you're not down a card here because you've got a two, three flyer. And this just, the, the spell scorn coven, I think this ability or this stat line plus ability might not read that exciting to a lot of people. Four mana, two, three, ETB, your opponent discards a card. But that's actually pretty strong. It, it's not like, uh, you know, big stabilizer on four, but that's okay. You know, one of the things I've been talking about a lot lately on the podcast, for those who have been listening for the past two sets, is make sure your four and five mana plays either block really well when they come down or have an, an ETB effect. And this one does have a good ETB effect. So I like Spell Scorn, uh, spell scorn Coven. What would you give this one? I think I'm going to give it uh, B minus. Yeah, that's exactly where I was going to go to. Sweet. Um, like I said, I, I hope blue black is cool, but uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't think that the the fairy deck is going to come together all that often. We'll see though. Yeah, and, and that front side again, it, it really is just a remand, right? Like return a spell to its hand and draw a card. But right. The card you draw is always the the spell scorn coven. Yes, that's a great way to put it. Yeah. Next up, moving on to red black. First red black uncommon here is uh, Totentan's Swarm Piper. So this is one black red for a two three legendary creature, human warlock bard. It says, when Totentan Swarm Piper, Totentans, I said it wrong, <laughs> Totentans Swarm Piper, or another non-token creature you control dies, create a 1-1 one, one black rat creature token with this creature can't block. So you're going to see this a lot. All the rat tokens have this creature can't block. Now. They're all 1-1s. One, also has an ability, one in a black, target attacking rat you control gains death touch until end of turn. So black red's theme this time is rats it's making all these one one uh, can't block rats you're going wide you're sacrificing them uh there's a mechanic we'll get to in a second that cares about sacrificing tokens totem hands on its own there is just a pretty good rate for a three drop though you're getting three mana for two three plus pseudo one one yeah well it is a dies effect mm -hmm. for it and the other creatures so 
less good than uh you know char forger or whatever it was yeah. from like a similar statted card from uh phyrexia all be one but that ability is going to be because your rats the whole point of them is can you turn them into a card because they yes. can't block you know they can't gain you life and chump they can't really trade with anything on attacks unless your opponent has a board of all x ones so how do you make those rats turn into something useful and this is just a way of saying yeah they're always going to be great yeah, one of the things I'm interested in is seeing if Black Red is more on the attrition side or more on the tempo-y aggro side, right? Because, you know, you can use these rats to attack too, of course, right? But like you said, there's the main use, I think, is sacrificing them for value for doing something or making them relevant somehow, which, of course, Totentans does. It makes them relevant in combat. So what do you want to give Totentans here? Uh, I'm not going to go that high, I think. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know what? I'll just give it another... Another B minus, I think. B minus. I was gonna go C plus on this one just because it, it does require you know it, you need a little bit to get it going, but I think it's a, it's a solid card. It does you know it reminds me of uh, a few cards in the past, like you mentioned Char Forger, um, but not quite as good. So let's go C plus. Can you stick on your B minus? Yeah, well, well, part of, like I, this is kind of cheating, but part of my rating is the fact that I think Black Red looks really good. Mm, okay, so <laughs> I'll probably have good stats even if it's not the best card. Nice. And then uh, our second one here is Callus Sellsword. This is our Black Red Adventurer. One in a black for a two-two, and it says when Callus Sellsword enters the battlefield. Oh, sorry, it, it does enter the battlefield with a plus one plus one counter on it for each creature that died under your control this turn. And then the sorcery side, burn together, single red mana for a sorcery. Target creature you control deals damage equal to its power to any other targets, and then you sacrifice it. Yeah, so this kind of forces a trade on the adventure side, mm -hmm. and then if you can if you can do that, it's going to be a little bit bigger. Um, there's not a ton of ways to sacrifice things in general. Like the the sacrifice is more on the well. You'll see there's there's a easy way to sacrifice enchantments and artifacts and tokens but not so much just regular pieces of cardboard yeah this so this, I, I believe this is actually the only thing that sacrifices a creature or one of the only like what's like one or two most things say sacrifice a, an enchantment or something creatures are actually creature sacrifice is actually kind of rare in this set aside from the bargain uh, cards, which we'll get to in a second yeah there's goblin bombardment sure that, that'll do it yeah that's, that's but, true that's true goblin bombardment yeah. also does it but yeah yeah very very few is what, is what the point we're making so it really is how much of a trade can you set up because this is not one where you're going to adventure it early and then want to hold on and cast the other one later you really want to do them in the same turn yes yeah that that is definitely this is not a very good card in your opener it's okay right it's you're not going to be like oh man the cell sword is my opener but you don't really want to play it on two because then it's just a two mana two two and it's fine if that's what you have to do but it's not just going to be good at any point great at any point in the game i should say um worth noting that this burn together it's kind of worded a little bit strangely, where it says, target creature you control deals damage equal to its power to other, any other target. You Then you sacrifice it. That's not something we generally see. Think of this just as a fling or a thud effect, where uh, you actually can get blown out if your opponent has a removal spell. With those other things, like fling, they say, sacrifice a creature in addition to cast this. This one's not like that. You have to be careful. They can blow you out in response. And one thing that we didn't mention, actually, just yet, is that adventures if the the a spell side gets countered it gets fizzled countered whatever you don't get the other side in ex exile it's just going to fizzle and go to your graveyard yes yep yep so what do you want to give this i was just going to give this a a c plus i think I, I think because it's it's a two drop that it's not great to play on two but ideally you just have a hand where maybe you play it on three where you double spell and maybe it's a three three and it is nice to have this this burn together sorcery when you top decker, right? Like this can kill them. It does go to any target. It's not just creature. So it's got it's a two drop that is good in the late game, not fantastic in the early game. I'm gonna give it a C plus, I think. But maybe you want to give it a little bit higher because you're uh your predilection for red black. No, no, I, I'm gonna give it a C plus. I think this is one where again, C plus is kind of the grade where you don't cut them if you're those colors. And if if you're black red with enough sources of each, I think you're always gonna play these. Yep. But I'm never looking to splash this one. So it's the, the power level for a gold card is pretty low compared to some of the other stuff. Yeah, I agree. And often you find that divide. You're like, oh, is this good enough that I would consider splashing this in my deck, right? And, and I don't think this one quite meets it. Oh, by the way, I do want to clarify too, chat's mentioning this. I said that your adventures fizzle if they uh, stop, you know, if they're, they get blown out, your opponent, you know, you cast something like a, a combat trick adventure like we'll see in a few uh, cards and they kill your creature underneath, your creature doesn't go to exile, your adventure creature. Burn together specifically, 
because it targets two things, your creature and whatever you're targeting, that actually is hard to fizzle. And I think that's why they worded it like that, right? So your adventure wouldn't fizzle. Anyways, let's move on to our red-green cards. What do we have up first? Ruby Daring Tracker. Red-green for a 1-2 legendary human scout with haste. Whenever Ruby attacks while well, you control a creature with power 4 or greater, Ruby gets plus 2, plus 2. And she can tap for red or green mana. Ooh, yeah, so pretty cool. Uh, the hasty mana dork, you know, on t obviously on turn two, it's going to be sometimes relevant. Sometimes you're just going to go two drop, play a one drop, right? And then later in the game, it, it just is a hasty three, four beater. This is what I like out of my mana dorks, right? It, it does something early and it turns into a relevant thing late. The ones that are only good early, definitely I'm a little bit lower on. But uh, for as good of a mana dork can be, I, I kind of like Ruby. Yeah, we've seen red green be a, a four power deck before mm -hmm. and usually both the theme and the deck are fairly bad yes. but I, I have i have hope for this i think red green is going to be good and i think yep. there's going to be enough four power cards to make it well supported i also have hope because i i think there's a few kind of design lessons they've learned about this archetype because it's something they've tried a lot and have not uh successfully <laughs> done it so much and one of those things we'll see in a second like you know they, they've really I, I can't remember the last time red green four powers matters was like that's the archetype you want to be in. i'm pretty sure it's, it's almost never anyways um yeah ruby's ruby's good i i would give ruby a b minus well, red green was pretty good in all B one. That is true, but it wasn't like a four powers matter thing, right? It was. It was no, no, yeah, no. Yeah. So, uh, what did you say you're going to give it? I'm going to give it a B minus. A B minus? Yeah. I think I want to go higher than that. Higher? You like a B? You like a B plus? Yeah, I'm going to give it a B. Okay, let's give it a B. And uh, what are those cards? Oh, sorry. Yo, go ahead. Good. Ahead. Yeah. Even even if you don't play something, the turn she comes down, like if you don't have a one drop, it's pretty easy to play a four drop on turn three, and then just have two like four drops in play essentially because this would be a three four plus your four drop mm -hmm. on turn three that's sick yeah that, yeah that, and that's not even like that oh my god we're really doing it right at Christmas <laughs> time type of thing. the other thing that's interesting too is because there are adventures like a lot of adventures only cost a mana or i should say a handful of them do you're gonna have something to do with that mana almost Im like immediately a lot of the time right you go haste you know play ruby she hastes out a, a one mana thing so that that situation i described actually isn't gonna be too uh, uncommon so yeah uh i think I i'm gonna say on my on my b minus but yeah b for b for mark next up yeah, we've there's, got well, there's, also, there's also a bunch of one mana instance right for both red and green yes. that can either protect this or make combat messy for opponents so so th there'll be quite a few times where you can top this immediately yeah i think so too and one of those cards that i was mentioning i think i think they've learned you know this is a little bit of a hint in the direction of ah this is how you want to make this theme work we've got picnic ruiner so this is the red green adventure one in a red for a 2-2. Two -two. Goblin Rogue, uncommon, like these all are. The Picnic Adventure, the 2-2, two -two, is a double striker if you control a 4 or greater power creature. Okay, so when it attacks, not on blocks. And the Sorcery side, Stolen Goodies, 3 and a green for a Sorcery. Distribute 3 plus 1 plus 1 counters among any number of target creatures you control. So what I like about this is it's a it's a payoff for your four power matters creatures that comes down on two right so you play your two you play your three and hey you play your four drop you've already gotten paid off because your two drop is the payoff not some five drop or something right that's what i like about this card and then you know the adventure it's, it's pretty nice in the late game right just being able to go these three things get bigger or you know this this one thing gets better um and then just have a pretty reasonable threat a two two most likely a two two double strike at that point yeah, this this card is one where I I would be okay splashing for it if you're a green deck and you just have a couple red sources, mm -hmm. or if you're a red deck with a couple green sources. A lot of these adventures are strong enough to splash, and this both of these, this one and the last one, are worded so that you can't get blown out mid combat because they're they're a trigger on your attack step. Right. So very important that your opponent can't really mess with that once your attack and the triggers happened. They can't remove the double strike or the plus two plus two. Yeah, so it would be a nightmare if you're like, okay, attack from a double strike and goblin. They're like, kill your four power creature, block my two three, right? So, yeah, yeah. You, you do avoid that. And I think you bring up a good point that I'm sure we're going to touch on in a little bit. But some of these, just like in Dominaria United, where you'd be like, okay, I want to throw in like a dual land for this off color kicker, right? I think you're going to do that a lot of the time in this set as well with the off color adventures. You're like, okay, I'll pick up an evolving wild, just a few little incidental fixing things in this set. That, like you said, you're, you're, some of them are good enough to splash. I want to give a B minus to Picnic Ruiner. Where are you at? 
I'm I'm gonna go another another B on this, same as I did both my red green cards. I'm gonna give a half grade higher. Yeah, and like you said, I think that's probably a little bit in the direction of you're you're, you're high on the Jund color pairs currently. Yeah, and they're also they're like a lot of the keys to is an archetype good, is a deck good, is do you have good two drops? Yes, definitely. And both of these are just good good two drops. Absolutely, agree. All right, now we're moving on to green white. So the first one here is Woodland Acolyte, and this is the adventure. So two and a white. The adventure side, or so the creature side is a 2-2, two, 3-minute two, 2-2 two, two, that when it enters the battlefield, you draw a card. So that's just pretty good. You know, we, we don't usually see that exact power and toughness, mana value, ability. 3-mana, 2-2, two, two, draw a card. I'm pretty happy with that. But the adventure side, it's green. Mend the Wild, single green mana for an instant. Put target permanent card from your graveyard on top of your library. So the idea here is you can combine these, right? And you go, okay, well, I 4-mana. Buy back something from my graveyard instead of draw a random card off the top of my library. And that's generally going to be better than drawing a random card unless you're trying to dig to something specific. Also nice that you can divide it up, right? You can go end of turn, mend the wilds on my turn, Woodland Acolyte. You don't have to you know, do it all in one turn. Yeah, it, this is a really nice split card, but it's also one where you... This is the first one where you're happy to play it. You need do not need a green source in your deck. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, you're just like, yeah, you're very happy with that. Yeah, three mana, two, two draw card is fantastic. And the adventure side is just pure upside. Yeah, uh, I think I'm just going to get this on a B plus. It's just so good when you draw it early. It's so good when you draw it late. I, I really like this card. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to join you there. Great, awesome. And uh, what's our... Ooh, this is, this is going to get lit into something else. So read out our second green-white uncommon here. Yes, this is Sir Armont, the Redeemer. Three green-white for a 4-4 four, four legendary human knight. When he enters the battlefield, create a monster roll token attached to another creature you control. What is a monster oh roll? Oh my god, token, what's a roll? It doesn't even say Ah, well, we have a very nice display here for everybody watching along here. Basically, rolls are one of the it's it's the headliner mechanic for this set. And what they are, are there's a lot of creatures that'll say when this enters the battlefield, you create a roll and you put it on your creature, or uh, you know, spells that create rolls, and all they are are aura tokens. Right, so there's six of them, uh, six rolls. There's monster, sorcerer. Oh, I had them very small here. Let me let me get them bigger. So I'm yeah, wicked, monster, sorcerer, royalty, young hero, and cursed. And they all do slightly different things, but they're mostly variations on give my creature plus one plus one. Uh, I'll read them out here quickly. Monster is uh, my creature gets plus one plus one and trample. Sorcerer is plus one plus one, and when I attack, I scry. Royal is plus one plus one and ward one. Young hero is whenever I attack, if my, what was it toughness or power? I actually can't see that. Toughness. toughness. So my toughness is less than three. You put a counter no, on No, 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 no. Oh. Much better than that. Okay. If your toughness is three or less. Three or less. Sorry. If your toughness is three or less. Much better. Yes, that is much, much better. You put a plus one plus one counter on it when you attack. Uh, the wicked roll is the creature gets plus one plus one. And when it dies, your opponent loses a life. And the cursed roll is the one you want to put in your opponent's creatures. It makes it a base power 1-1 one, one creature. So that's a lot. A little bit of onboarding, especially if you're just listening audio only. You've never seen this before. But uh, I have a feeling, Mark, you probably have some thoughts on these rolls and just this mechanic. Yeah, one more small point to clarify for those listening. It's base power and toughness. One, ah, one, yes, not just sorry. Power. Yep. Yeah. You said 1-1, one, one, so it was implied. But totally. yeah, just, just to clarify that. So the other thing to note about these rolls is... All of the cards that add rolls say when this comes into play, you remove your rolls from the creature first, and then you add this one. So you can't yes. have a creature that has more than one roll that you put on it. But if you put a cursed roll on your opponent's creature, it can it can have a cursed roll from your side, and it can have a buff roll from their side. Yes, exactly. So when people realize that, I, I I've been following your Discord quite carefully in, in the spoiler season. And a lot of people said, oh, you know, it's unf the, you, you can't uh, knock off their protective rolls with cursed rolls, so that makes it worse. But on the flip side, your opponent can't knock off the cursed roll with their buff rolls. But I, we, we need to find a better word for this. We're going to get <laughs> rolling all the way. To, to roll, the roll, 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 roll. Roll token. How about that? Just say roll token. That's probably better. Yeah, but most of these are fairly aggressive. Uh, two of them specifically, you ha or three of them. Or two, yeah, two of them. You have to attack to have the, actually something trigger, and then ward and trample. And most of these, because they're auras, they're going to want to enable an attack for you. Mm -hmm. So if you have a creature that's going to trade with the opponent, this might mean that they can't trade anymore. 
Or if you had a creature that didn't have a good attack, you might be able to now have a, a trade available. Um, with the exception being for the Cursed Roll, which is the most interesting one, I think, and the one that's probably worth talking about the most. But let's save that for when we see that on the card. Definitely. We've kind of got a snapshot of these, and we can almost evaluate them as we go instead of spending a ton of time on this slide right yes, now. Yes, I 100% agree. Okay, so, uh, and one, yeah, and one more thing before we go back to our green-white-gold card, that, you know, we kind of started level one, I think, Mark kind of jumped to level three where how they're going to play the level two of this of understanding how you fit into the set is this is a set that cares about enchantments cares about enchantments going to your graveyard entering sometimes um, and it cares about just permanence entering the battlefield there's a mechanic celebrate that uh, cares about how many permanents you you had enter the battlefield so just there are some infrastructural things that make these tokens even a little bit better than they might read. So just to keep that in mind. Um, and back to Sir Armand here, just because, you know, it's, it's, we just talked about rolls. Sir Armand, for reminder, we just talked about it a second ago. Five mana, three green, white, four, four. When it enters the battlefield, create a monster rule token attached to target creature you control. And that's the, the trample, plus one, plus one, one. And enchanted creatures you control get plus one, plus one. So the, Sir Armand comes down, going to bring at least six, six worth of stats. Yeah, so this card has some interesting tension because you want to have as many rolls as possible so all your creatures can get that extra bone of, of the plus one plus one. Mm -hmm. But you also can never have more than one on the same creature. Right, so it's like... So a, a, lot, of, a lot of the um, themes in the set between we'll see another mechanic soon and both of them kind of have this tension where it's not like um, Tempting the Ring where just the more you have the better mm -hmm. empirically. There's kind of that cap where you want to start to be careful and balance things a little bit. Because there's nothing worse than having your board full of creatures with rolls on them and then holding another card that adds a roll in hand and not being able to do anything with it. Yes, definitely. So it's like you're sort of going wide and then sort of going tall. It's a little bit of a hybrid strategy. It's kind of funny because you, you like you, you said, it's, it's not just a... When I first read this mechanic, I'm like, oh, it's like... You know, it's their way of doing plus one, plus one counters in this set. Like, kind of like they do with oil counters, but they weren't actually plus one, plus one. Not sure, quite true, because you can't can't just build them up. So, back to Sir Armand. Um, I think this card's pretty strong. Good enter the battlefield effect. It's a lot of stats. It's going to come in with multiple permanents. It triggers celebration by itself. You know, it's only these these five mana. I feel like they're always green-white, too. They're always kind of like, it looks pretty good, but then, you know, they're, yeah, it doesn't actually play end up playing that well. I do think I'm going to start fairly high on Sir Armand and give it a B minus. Uh, yeah, I think that sounds reasonable. There's cool. not as many free tokens in the green and white. Like, you get a bunch of rats in red and black. Yep. So it's going to be hard to go as wide with green white, but six stats for five mana is already a pretty good deal, and it can do even more than that. Yeah, and I didn't mention this before when we were talking about green white, but green white's thing, as you might have guessed, is caring about enchantments and enchanted creatures. Moving on to black white now, we've got Shrouded Shepherd for our adva adventure creature. One and a white for a 2-2. Two -two. When it enters the battlefield, target creature you control gets plus two, plus two until end of turn. And then the adventure side, Cleave Shadows, one and a black for a sorcery. Creatures your opponents control get negative one, negative one until end of turn. So before Mark says anything, I want to say that uh, the rate on this is really, really pushed. Just two mana, 2-2, two -two, comes in, buffs something. It's we've seen this card before, and it's like two mana one uh, because plus one plus one. It's been an okay passable card. Plus two plus two is a really big upgrade. It's almost like a hasty. You know, it's going to enable an attack. Uh, kind of two two of hasty damage. You know, they you know that feeling when your opponent casts the rally the Hornburg and gone that first two points. That's going to happen a lot of the time with this card. Just you play a two, you play you know uh, maybe on turn four you play this and another two. You're it's like wow I my I can't block that. It's a big chunk of damage. And then it's got the adventure side. So I just wanted to talk up that just vanilla-ish side first before we talk about the story story side because I know Mark has something to say about one toughness creatures in this set. Yeah, well, yeah, we could talk more about the adventure side first because this, yeah, this card is ridiculous. Yeah, Normally it's... you get two kind of filler level cards yep. on adventures where each half is a filler but then you combine them and, and it's actually like really strong. Mm -hmm. And this card, two mana for minus one, minus one to opponent's board is a card that's been printed before like that's that's not a bad card it's not over costed and then the other side the creature side usually you pay three mana for that for a two two yeah. with a two plus two boost so this card is great yeah yeva's force mage is kind of like the most recent example of that and it's yeah like you said a whole mana more and it's such a fantastic package um did you want to get into the, the the one toughness thing here or do you want to save it for maybe down the line 
Yeah, yeah, you're referring to my uh, my insightful Twitter posts, I'm sure. <laughs> yes, of course. Yeah, so this I posted this um, the day before the full set release dropped. So at that point, we had most of the uncommons, most of the rares, but only half of the commons had been spoiled. And I noticed that there was quite a few of these ping or minus one, minus one, minus one effects in the set. There's mm -hmm. actually five of them. Wow, yeah. So more than usual. Um, this one being the only one, I believe, I'm trying to remember the other four. Yeah, this is the only one that does it to everything. So I noticed, well, why are these all these pingers? How many creatures is this really going to hit? So similar to how Sirkovitz does his analysis is before Sirkovitz actually posted how many <laughs> percentage of things one toughness damage is going to kill. I started to do a, a search and noticed also that there's a ton of tokens in the set. So tokens, not only do they have one power, but they also have one toughness. So they kind of play on both sides of this. So my observation was that you really want to you're really going to want to have more than one toughness on a creature in general, because not only is there the five ping effects in the set, there's also going to be a ton of one power creatures lying around. Yep. Um, so th that was kind of the level one observation is that the second point of toughness is going to matter more than usual. But then the next thing is, well, a lot of times when there's a lot of pingers, you just don't play one toughness creatures. Right. Because you're okay, there's too many effects, it's just gonna die, I won't even bother playing my, my X one. Mm -hmm. But again, because not only is there so many tokens, but there's a ton of two ones, three ones, and just material that's just gonna end up lying around. We've seen all the the rats already. And I noticed there was about Somewhere between 15 and 20 one toughness creatures only at common and uncommon. And then even more than usual on the rare side as well. So I think this is going to be a set where starting from turn one, there's a lot of playable one drops. There's going to be a lot of one power and one toughness creatures lying around. And so this effect where you're giving minus one, minus one to everything, it's going to be even more uh, powerful than usual. And I, I think think there's a chance you would play this card for the adventure side alone, which is yeah. saying a lot. That's I was just going to ask you that, and I think I think that could be true. So I'm going to give Shrouded Shepherd a B plus. I I could see it creeping into like the A minus range, honestly, but I'm going to start on B plus. Yeah, yeah, it's it feels like too much of a hot take to go into. I know, range right? For this, yeah. But I, I I totally agree. It's between a B plus and an A minus for this thing. Yeah, it's always funny because you know, of, of course, our reviews are maybe not the best place for hot takes, but it's a, you. Know, I always want to come out so you know, like in my, in my mind, I kind of wanted to give it an A plus, but I'm tempering myself and going to say B minus. And you know, I won't get the glory if I end up being right, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, next up, we've got Neva Stalked by Nightmares. This is the gold uncommon for black white, two black white for a two two menace. It's a human noble. When Neva enters the battlefield, return target creature or enchantment from your graveyard to your hand. So we've got a, a 4 mana 2 2 menace gravedigger. Okay, solid baseline. Whenever an enchantment you control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, you put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on Neva, then you scry 1. Yeah, so the that line of text in most sets would be basically irrelevant. Mm -hmm. But in this set, not only is there a number of auras, but also, of course, we have the rolls. Yes. So the rolls, because you can only ever have one on at a time, if either your creature with a roll dies, or if you put a second roll on that creature and the first one falls off, you're going to get that trigger with the plus one, plus one counter and scry one. And anytime you can do that, it's going to be... It makes a big difference when you add a plus one, plus one counter on something for free. Yes, definitely. And there's also enchantments like that sacrifice themselves and there's things that th this ability is going to be relevant black white's thing by the way is enchantments going to the graveyard right where green white was them entering and you care about them this black white cares about them seeing them on the way out i've heard some rumbles that uh four mana you know grave digger is not uh, as good in 2023 as it was in you know the years of yesterday and i think it's probably true but i think it's still pretty good like i think this is still going to be a, a good card yeah, there's going to be a lot of uh, boomer checks in this set where <laughs> cards that used to be great either on the bonus sheet or just like callbacks in, in the main set. I was like, oh my god, this I can't believe they're printing this card. And then you take a while to think about it. And you're like, okay, I, I, I get it. It's not actually that good anymore. Yeah, things have changed in the past 20 years or whatever. So what do you want to give Neva? Uh, I still like Neva a lot. We haven't even seen, I, I, you alluded to it, but we haven't even seen the, the bargain keyword, which is also going to help not only give you fuel for this, but also trigger that last ability. Mm -hmm. um, 
And again, maybe this is the boomer in me speaking, but I'm still probably going to be splashing for this right. this creature. Uh, so I was going to give it like a B. Yeah, that's where I was going to land too. And you know, there's some folks saying like, oh, you know, this is a late game card, not as great on turn four. I, I don't think that's true. I think it's not that uncommon that if you want to, you'll have a creature in the graveyard by turn four, you trade it off. Like if you don't have a creature on the board by turn four, you're in some trouble anyways, right? So if you have this in your hand, it's not going to be that uncommon that you just go, all right, you attack with your two, I block my two, I get it back later. So I like B for Neva. Next up, we've got our green black cards. And green black, like it was last time in Eldraine, is food. So we've got Greta, Sweet Tooth Scourge. This is one black green, three mana for a three, three human warrior. When Greta enters the battlefield, you create a food token. And it has two abilities, a green one, single green mana, sacrifice a food, put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature. You can only activate this as a sorcery. Second ability here, one in a black, sack of food, draw a card, and you lose a life. Wow, a lot going on here. So three mana, three, three, enter the battlefield, make a food, then two abilities that uh, help you use your food afterwards, either growing your creatures or drawing some cards. Yes. Yeah, so, so what is a, a sweet tooth scourge? Is it like someone who cooks a lot of vegetables? Like... I believe that the the <laughs> sweet tooth is like. I actually know the lore slightly, and I might get this wrong, but I think it's like these like candy monsters that are coming to destroy things. I think I think the the candies are are bad in in the food world here in Greta's story. Um, but I like your I like your descriptor a little bit better. <laughs> Just someone who eats a lot of rapini. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> uh, what's uh? I was gonna say, what's your take on rapini? No. What's your take on Greta? <laughs> Uh, there's actually not that much food in the set. So it's another one of those kind of like blue black fairies where there's not as much support as you might have expected when you just see the signpost uncommon. Yeah. Food has been shown to be quite powerful so that I can understand why they did that. But other than the one that Greta spots you, I don't think you're going to end up with multiple, like an, an endless source of food to keep drawing cards or putting counters on things for. Right. I, I think uh, those coming from original Eldraine, you should expect not to see as many food cards as you did in that set. Like the, I, I like we were just talking about how uh, the you know adventures and the roles are kind of the, the big things in this set. Food's not one of the big things. So if you're taking Greta, like, I feel like they push Greta so that the food player is really going to have a really good payoff. Um, and if you're there, it's really good. Yeah, I actually really like a lot of the design choices at first glance for this set where some of the slightly worse colors seem to have maybe like better rares or some mm. of the worst archetypes seem to have better gold uncommons and I, i'm really curious to see how the balance of this set plays out because i at a glance it's hard to, to conceptualize everything before we've played but it looks to be fairly well balanced in my opinion yeah i think so too so i'm going to start with the assumption that food doesn't just you know fall off into obscurity and it's not a deck you ever want to draft i'm going to assume it's a deck you're going to draft from you know draft and draft out I'm going to give Greta a B plus because it's a three mana three, three that enters and has a good ETB and has other abilities. Like you draw this in the late game in a food deck, you're, you're just like your opponent's like crap. They're going to draw a bunch of food or or sorry, draw, draw a bunch of cards or their creature just going to get out of range of me dealing with them so quickly. I'll go with a B. Cool. I'm yeah. Go Sounds good. Yeah. Uh, our second green black card here is the adventure gingerbread hunter. So this is five mana four and a green for a five, five. And says, when it enters the battlefield, you make a food token. Okay, five mana, five, five, make a food token. Puny Snack is the adventure side. Instant, two in a black. Target creature gets negative two, negative two until end of turn. So a kind of clunky-ish removal spell. Yeah, right. So that's a removal spell. You wouldn't play that if it was a mm -hmm. common, right? A three mana, minus two, minus two. Yeah. But when you get it for free on a on a good card, it's, it's going to be great. Yeah, it's a kind of... Uh, you know, scaled up bone crusher giant in some ways, right? It's like removal on one side, big creature on the other. Uh, obviously nowhere near as efficient, but it's kind of the same idea. This card's good. It's like, I, I would play five mana, five, five, make a food sometimes. Like, not always, but sometimes. Having that uh, that instant adventure, that pushes over the edge. Yeah, and there's also a another one of the themes we're going to see is CMC uh, five plus. Right. And so this is a good five drop where it also doesn't have the downside of being stuck in your hand until turn five where you can't do anything with it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think this will see play in multiple decks. And again, just like uh, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but happy to splash for this card in either a green or a black deck. Yeah, definitely. Welcome to set reviews where you just sound like a broken record because <laughs> you're saying the same things about a lot of different cards. 
All right, next up, what do we have for our? Well, what, 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 are you, what are you rating this card? Oh, sorry, come here, we forgot rating. Uh, you That's first. We're here, of course, yeah. So speaking of things you're gonna hear in Sarah reviews, ratings. Mark, you go first. What do you like for this one? Uh, I think this is about as good as Greta. I'm gonna give it a B as well. Yeah, I, I was going to as well. I, I was gonna give this a little bit lower than Greta, so B. I'll join you at B there for Gingerbread Hunter. All right, next up, our blue green archetype. What do we have? We have Troyan Gutsy Explorer. One blue green for a 1 3 legendary Vidalcan Scout. Troyan taps for blue green that can only be spent to cast spells with mana value 5 or more, or spells with X in their cost. And you can pay blue and tap her to, or him, I guess maybe it's a him, to draw a card and discard a card. So it's it's promising a lot here. You're, you're like, all right, three mana, one, three. That kind of sucks. But tap sad, blue and green for your big spells. Like two mana, three mana, mana dork that adds two mana. That's a lot. And then when you're done adding mana, you can start looting. It, it's the thing I like about, you know, a good quality of a mana dork. But it's a three mana, one, three. <laughs> so like the, you know, the times you're going yeah. to untap with this and your opponent, like your, your opponent's going to play this sometime. You're not going to have interaction spell. They are going to, you know, slam a, a five drop, six drop even, potentially. And that's going to be pretty darn good for them. But the flip side of this is there's going to be a lot of times where you just don't, the opponent just doesn't have that expensive card in hand, or you kill this pretty efficiently, and it's kind of a letdown, right? So, I don't have high hopes for Troy Ann. Uh, would love to be wrong, but I think this is one of the worst ones we've seen. Yeah, most of these gold cards have been, like, we talk about the B letter being a pull into those colors mm -hmm. where you open and you're like, oh, I kind of want to go these colors because of this card. And this is certainly a card where you're not going to open this and be like, okay, I'm drafting blue-green now. Yeah. That being said, if you are in blue-green, I think you'll take it in some number of decks. I'm going to give it a C. Yeah, and kind of the joke here with the, the five mana value or greater is you can... Kind of like if you're used to drafting uh, Karuga Companion. One of the things about Karuga Companion is you really like adventures, like Bone Crusher Giant and uh, the uh, you know uh, what's the uh, Brazen Borer, right? All, all if you're cubing, you're, you want these three mana cards that aren't actually three mana because Karuga you can't play three mana or uh, below three mana cards in your deck. But these adventures, you know, they let you put more expensive cards in your deck, right? So you could have the card we just looked at a second ago, the the Gingerbread Eater guy, and you can put more than of those kind of cards in your deck than usual because adventures are usually cheaper on the on the you know the adventure is going to be cheap on the big creature. So that's kind of the design idea behind this. I'm you know I'm I'm gonna re re like hold my complete judgment until we play the set of course. But as a baseline, I'm gonna start this as like a D plus. I, I actually part of this is not having a lot of faith in blue green ramp because that archetype very rarely actually pans out, and part of it is the card itself. Yeah, I don't. So if you just look at the golden commons, people will come to the conclusion that blue green is going to be the worst color as it often is. Yeah. I my perhaps hot take is that I I don't think it's going to be one of the best ones, but I don't think it'll be the worst archetype. Sure, I'd be surprised okay. if blue green ends up being the worst archetype. Yeah, that's I I can buy that. You, have we seen what you think is the worst archetype you just had or It yeah, I I think it might be blue white, okay. but that's We'll see. Yeah. I, I'm just, I'm not going to pick one though. I'm just going to say totally. blue, green, not, not in last. Yeah. And by, gonna, and by the way, I think we also, I also should say that, uh, you know, whenever me or Mark is like, Oh, I, you know, our analysis of the set says this about it, you know, like this isn't, you know, come back to us in a week after you've played. We could be wrong about that. Certainly the one we've been, we've had a good track record, I will say, but we called black the worst color in March in the machines. And it was one of the best one. Right. So it, we, I like it. Have a good track record. Not the end all be all though, so to check back in after you play with the card. The yep. secondary blue green uncommon here is Tempest Heart. Three and a green for a three four trample. Whenever you cast a spell with mana value five or greater, you put a plus one plus one counter on Tempest Heart. The adventure side is scan the clouds, one in a blue for an instant. You draw two cards, and then you discard two cards. Yeah, like you really wish at least one of these two uncommons was actually good because this one is not. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? It's the creature side is like kind of unexciting. It's it, it blocks okay, but it's just it's a format of three, four. Scan the clouds. Like you're not too sad to cast this card. It's it's just card filtering. Like the you know generally if you you wouldn't ever put draw two discard two in your deck because you're down a card you cast this card and you're actually just down a card the idea here of course is like you're not actually down a card because you get a creature on this side so you're just improving the quality of your hand at this cost of two mana which is not nothing 
But like, yeah, I don't know. The payoff here is fine. I, I like this a little bit better than the other one. I think that the blue green uncommon, the gold one we saw. Well, the other downside is out of all the decks where you want to filter the least in, mm. it's going to be the one where you need to hit your fifth or sixth land to cast your, your expensive cards, right? Yes. Yeah. That's, that's, so, that's a great point. Yeah. I... Ugh. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not excited by this card. Yeah. I am going to give it a, I think, C-. minus. And again, that's kind of optimistic, saying that blue green's going to be not totally terrible. But Yeah, I was going to just give it, it a C. probably should be. You're going to go, sorry? I was just going to give it a C, but you, if, if you want to give it lower, I think that's fine. Like, I I'm, I'm, I don't feel too bad about this. I don't think it's an awful card. I think you're, you're going to play it when you're blue green, which is kind of, and, and be okay with it, which is, you know, the definition of a C. So, I don't know, you want to give it lower than that? Yeah, I'm gonna. I, you know what? I'm gonna go back to Troyan and I'm gonna give them both C minuses. Okay. I think they're pretty similar power level cards. That's fair. Yeah, and that brings us to I believe the last color pair here, blue or red. We got our adventure here is Frolicking Familiar. So this is two in a blue for a two two flyer, and it says whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, Frolicking Familiar gets plus one plus one until end of turn. So it's pseudo prowessy. Only cares about instants and sorceries generally. We see this uh, two man, a three mana two two prowess slot as an okay playable, uh, not not very exciting, but it has this adventure side blow off steam single red mana instant blow off steam deals one damage to any target. Ooh yeah, that's that's big. So the second second pinger of the five that we yep. talked about, um, and again, this fact that you can split the costs and just leave this up. Deal one damage to something is going to be really relevant, especially when you can, when you can do it on turn one. Mm -hmm. And then even on turn four, just having a 2-2 two -two that you can ping something when it comes into play. This can help you trade up in a combat. It can kill an X1. It can trigger your instant and sorcery stuff. It kind of it slices, it dices, it does it all. Yeah, it's just this is exactly what your, your like blue-red tempo -y deck is going to want, right? Um, yeah, I, I'm going to give Frolicking Familiar a B-. minus. I think I'm going to go higher than that, just because oh, wow. I really like the ping effect. Like the ping effect, yeah. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, and no, I could be talked up. I think you've done more analysis on the pinging stuff than I have. So if you are if you feel strongly about that, I'll just join you. Okay, yeah, yeah. I'm just going to go with a B. Then we get to our blue-red-gold card, which is an interesting one. This is Johan Apprentice's Sorcerer. So this is two blue-red for a 2-5. So big butt, wish coin crab stats. You may look at the top card of your library at any time. Once each turn, you can cast an instance or sorcery spell from the top of your library, and this still like this counts adventures. So you can actually cast the instant sorceries from the top of your library. You can't cast the creature side though, but you know you cast the, the instant sorcery. The other side goes to the exile. Yes, yes, because every adventure is an instant or sorcery on the front side. Although I will note, not every adventure is a creature on the back side anymore. That's right. Yep. Um, but yeah, the fact that you can cast adventures with this means it's not going to be hard. To have a deck where you have 15 to 20 hits with this mm -hmm. um and the stats on it are great for de like defense and prolonging it and making sure you get more looks so i think this card is really strong yeah i was lower on this when i first saw it but uh, after seeing a little bit of you know just the, the whole set five is a lot like five is a lot of time is for four mana your opponents often even aren't gonna have like sometimes you have this value creature that you 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 know don't want to block with. It's four mana, five mana value creature. Your opponent attacks in with their two two, and you're like, well, oh, crap. Like either I have to block and get gotten by a trick, or I take the damage. And you know, taking damage is bad if I'm trying to play a long game, essentially. And uh, this one, I think you're going to be okay blocking a lot of the time because the five tops is is pretty difficult to get through. Do you think there's some amount of tension with this card and the last card? This is a bit of a longer game card. The uh, other one's a bit more of a tempo card, or you think the Otter is just going to be good, even in a bit of a slower deck? Yeah, I think the Otter is just going to be a good card in general. Like, I, I think there's going to be a lot of time where Ping is is just going to trade with card. Right, yeah. No, I think so, too. I, I just, yeah, just wanted to get a, your, your vibe on that. And I think, in general, blue-red looks a little bit slower than the other red color pairs. Like, sometimes blue-red is a little more tempo-y, sometimes a little more grindy. I think it looks a little bit grindier, but it could be tempo, too. I, I think it just is going to depend on the make of your deck. A lot of times, in, in a lot of formats, blue-red can be both. What do you want to give Johan here? Yeah, the, the tension to me is more the fact that you have to like tap out to cast yes, it because agreed. a lot of times you're going to want to be leaving up your spells deck is going to want to leave up counters and, and stuff like that. Um, but Johan, I'm going to give probably just another B. I think Johan's great. Yeah, I was going to go a little bit lower. I was going to say B plus for Johan, but yeah, same or same ballpark. 
lower with a B plus? That's why I said oh, sorry, B. B minus, B minus, my bad. <laughs> B minus, yeah. Oh, sorry, I was wrong. There is one more color pair here, and it says red white. So right away, we've got Ash Party Crasher here. This is two two haste and da 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 new ability celebration. Whenever Ash Party Crasher attacks, if two or more non-land permanents enter the battlefield under your control this turn, put a plus one plus one counter on Ash. So two minute two two haste. It's all baseline. And then she can attack for three a lot of the time, too, especially if you play her on turn two or turn three. So Celebration, or sorry, on turn three or turn four. Celebration's overall, if you were to describe it to somebody, it's not always this ability. It's if two or more non-land permanents enter the battlefield under uh, this turn. That's that's what the, the triggering condition is. The output is different on every card. Yeah, I'm surprised you forgot about red wipes being for last, because this is my vote for week one. Week one? Best stat. Yeah, right? I, th I think so, too. This This one looks really pushed. Might not stay that way into week three and four, but I think week one, it's it's normally with a, an ability like Celebration, you'd be like, oh, well, how often am I going to have two cards to play in the later turns, especially on like a three or four drop with Celebration? It's going to be hard to double spell and get a trigger. Mm -hmm. But there's so many cards that trigger this on on its own. Yeah, the, and there's a cycle of commons we're going to see that are uh, their adventures that have a one mana adventure to put a roll on something and then are just like vanilla creatures on the other side and there's a lot of that kind of stuff going on right just a lot of little things that are just one mana to put a permanent on the battlefield make a roll you know we've seen a few creatures already that just enter the battlefield and, and satisfy this condition already so celebration's a mechanic that you're going to play with your uh your your tokens right your uh, your food tokens and of course your roll tokens those things too so yeah, this this is a really pushed aggro card. I want to give a B to Ash. Yeah, it, this is notably they've done this a lot with the aggressive cards recently, where it does force you to tap mana pre combat because mm -hmm. um, you need to trigger your celebration pre combat in in most of the cases. So you're going to have to have that trigger happen, and your opponent will know whether you have a trick up or not, and it'll give you a lot less flexibility to do that. But the stats on this are are good and. If you can trigger it right away, it's going to be really strong. Notably, it does have to attack to get that trigger, though. Right, yeah. It's not just like you can keep growing it, growing it, growing it, and then you get in for the big attack once it's finally out of range of their blockers. Yeah. So yeah. What, what did you say for Ash? I was going to give it a B. I think it's just a, a, a pretty pushed card. I'm going to go B-. minus. Okay. I think the... the I, I don't think it's actually a very good top deck. Right, yeah, like, that's fair. That's a fair point. And even your aggro decks care about that, right? It's not. It's, it's not like uh, you're like, oh, you're an aggro deck. You don't get like. You still care about turn five, turn six, what you're drawing. Uh, and then bring us home on these gold cards here. What's our last one? We have Imidane's Recruiter, two and a red for a human knight. Uh, it's a two-two when it enters the battlefield. Creatures you control get plus one, plus zero, oh, and gain haste until end of turn. And it has an adventure side. The adventure is train troops for four and a white, which is a sorcery. Create two 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 white knight creature tokens with vigilance. Whew, this card, this is a nice one. <laughs> so you know, pairing that with just you know, we're talking about how good we think red white's gonna be week one. Uh, pairing that with this, with Ash or any of the celebration creatures when you cast train troops, yeah, that's that's triggering your celebration. But the the creature side here, the baseline of this looks a little bit weird. But you can think of this just as a a three mana three two haste, and and that's we've seen that uh, ability or that stat line. A decent amount in the past few years and it's always been okay but giving your other creatures a big boost that really matters like that's that's going to end a lot of games yeah this uh, it's not going to be often where you cast both sides of this together although if you do it's a real beating yeah <laughs> um but just having the the this is more of like a split card, but mm -hmm. if you if you can hold off to the five mana and then have this in reserve, your opponent's just gonna die. Yeah, or or even you know just like on turn you cast this on turn five and you cast this and another three drop on like the creature side another two, three drop on turn six like that's or just a two drop that's that's a really really good curve and the, the next creature you play has haste too like you can just it, you can do the, the rally at the Hornburg thing right where you go like play my non hasty creature and then play my Imodane's recruiter or you know uh, rally and now everything just bashes in. Uh, B plus? B, B plus? I don't know. Where, where do you want to end, end on this one? Yeah, I, th I think I'm going to go B yeah, again. I think so, too. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And, and one last thing about adventures, if you haven't played with them before, don't be afraid to run out the adventure side just on curve if you have nothing else to do. Like, if, if you've got another two drop and an adventure two drop, sure, play the non-adventure two drop first. But, you know, if you've got this one, for example, and you're maybe even three lands in hand, 
just play it on turn three, right? If you have no other play, it's it's definitely going to be worse to just skip your turn than to get, you know, you're not missing out on value if you're just losing the game. Like, you know, it's a, don't, don't worry too much about that. So yeah, great card though. Yeah. Yeah, there is some context to that, I think. There, there will be times when you should just play this on turn three, mm -hmm. but there will also be times where it's better to do nothing on turn three. Interesting. You think so? Like, there's this... I, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah, you're right. It's going to be, you can show me a board state and be like, or a game state and be like, yes, you're right about that. I, I think I'm only saying that because I think most people's inclinations is to not do it. Where I think you're coming from the perspective of, I know I should play my creature most of the time on curve. I think a lot of people yeah. are like, uh, I don't know if I should or not. Right. So yes, you're, you're definitely right. There are some times, but that's not going to be your default. Yeah, I'm. I'm gonna. Yeah, it's it's about looking for the right spots yep. and knowing what the default is, and the default will definitely be to just cast it if you have nothing else to do. And that's the end of our gold cards. Uh, we've got some artifacts before we move into the colors here. First one up is Candy Trail. So this is a single mana for a clue, <laughs> a, f a food clue even. I actually didn't notice that when I read this the first time. It's both a food and a clue. It says when Candy Trail enters the battlefield, you scry two. This is a common, by the way. Uh, so one mana, ETB, scry two, and it also has the clue <laughs> slash food text of two, sack, sacrifice candy trail, you gain three life, and you draw a card. Yeah, this is what my house looks like most of the time when my <laughs> eight-year-old's running around. You Love just it. follow the trail of, like, cereal and snacks and candy and Lego around the house, and you can find them. The, the ten-foot-long, uh, gummy worm in this, <laughs> in this picture, do you have one of those at home? They actually have those. I I've seen pictures of them. They have these, like novelty gummy worms <laughs> um this is a weird one this is a strange interesting it's kind of like lembus from lord of the rings a little bit right yep and lembus was a card i played more and more as the format went on mm -hmm. uh this i don't know if it's better or worse because certainly the the package the total package spending three mana scry two gain three draw a card is better than the four mana lembus package yeah but the front side of this is worse than the front side of Lumba. So I, I, they're probably very similarly rated cards. Yeah, I would say it's too. This is the kind of card, like, it, usually when you see a trinkety card like this, it reads really strangely, and they're like, oh, but it goes in this deck. I get it. Yeah, there's some of that, but there's not, like, an immediate home for Candy Trail. Like, if you think about Bargain, which I'm actually surprised we haven't gone to a Bargain card yet, but basically, before we actually read out the text, it, Bargain is a mechanic that wants you to sacrifice artifacts uh, or, or enchantments or tokens. And this is an artifact that you can sacrifice, but the problem is... When you're sacrificing it to something else, you're just one mana scry to, and that's not particularly good. I guess it's kind of okay with um, celebration cards, but I don't think you want to play this in your in your aggro decks very often. So I think it's mostly going to fill that role of, hey, I've got a few things in here that care about gaining three or, you know, just having a food. And I don't think it's a card that's like, oh, I'm just going to load up on it. I mean, it can't be. It just can't be. Yeah, I, I don't think you're ever going to be like, oh, my deck really needed, like, one of these. <laughs> yeah, just like, you're like, oh, man, pack three, pick eight, come on, our last chance to see a candy trail. Yeah, that's, that's not going to happen too often. But I can also see myself playing it a, a good amount. That's yeah. just, like, a weird thing to say. <laughs> Which is funny. It, well, well, the reason you can, you're can you saying that is because it's a card you're going to get late and is an okay card, right? That's that's the reason why, mostly, right? Yeah. <sighs> what do you want to give this? What, what, like, what'd you end up with giving Lembus by the end of the set? Maybe that's a good way to frame this. Probably like a C. Yeah. Like I played it in 60-ish percent of the decks that I drafted. And yeah. I think this might be similar. Although this is the set is more aggressive. So maybe it'll be a little bit lower. But I, I think I'll still just go with a, with a C with this. Yeah, I was going to give it a C minus. But I think we're kind of... This is definitely one where the, the conversation around is going to be a little more important than the letter grade. Because it's, it's pretty contextual. Yeah. yeah, this is a card where you're not going to have to play it in the first two weeks, really. Because people <laughs> are going to be passing you much better cards. But yes. then once you get towards the end of the format, you'll be playing more more of these. So this is like a, a last week of the format C type, type of card. Right, which is something that I think doesn't get talked about that much. Where it's just like your decks are going to be... You know, week one we were like, oh, Red White's going to be maybe the best deck. That's because nobody, you know, people tend to st stay away from the aggro cards week one. The general population, I think they have a hard time kind of evaluating a great aggro card. That's generally why. R Red White was one of the better decks in Lord of the Rings in week one and kind of trailed off past that. Um, so, yeah, definitely good good little addendum there on Candy Trail. Yeah. And you know what? I'll, I'll just, because that, of that caveat, I'll just join you with a C- minus just to keep things simple. Cool. Sounds good. Ooh, we got an old favorite back. What's up next? Next is Ginger Brute. One mana for a 1-1 one, one food golem with haste, an artifact creature, I should say. And pay one, it can't be blocked this turn except by creatures with haste. And pay two, tap sack it to gain three life. 
Yeah, so this was a it was a banger, honestly, in the original Eldraine, because it went in your mono red aggro deck, your mono white deck that cared about artifacts. It went in uh, your your food decks or your mono green decks. I think there's slightly less of a natural home for these decks, or I really should say its homes are not as uh, as varied as as they would be in original Eldraine. But I think this is going to be a solid card in a lot of your decks. Just in your aggro decks, you're still going to want this in your red white aggro decks. It's a it's a one mana card that. Uh, is hard to block and triggers your celebration. Just, you know, you want cheap cards for your celebration cards. Yeah, it just does a lot of little things. I actually like this card for a reason you haven't mentioned, Ooh. in that there's so many cards that give free rolls, especially for low mana. Yes, that is a fantastic point. That's what often what you'd want to do with Ginger Brew is, is like originally, you'd put an aura on it or put a, a counter on it. If you, the, the difference between a one power unblockable creature and a two power unblockable creature is really large. So if you can put a roll on it, you're, you're, you're in business, the Ginger Brute. And if your Ginger Brute decides to become a young hero, oh, then you're really... Oh, yeah, wow. That's a young hero, Ginger Brute. I like that. Is that how, uh, you know, that's the story? It eventually turns into Sir Ginger. You got you put the uh, <laughs> the roll on it, and it's, you know, full-on story arc here. So I would yeah, have given... Yeah. Oh, sorry, good, good, good. Well, I was just going to say, so that, that I'm higher on Ginger Brute, which is also part of... This is kind of, you can understand the higher on Pingers, because it's kind of a... A, a threat and answer assessment if i think that the one toughness threats are better then mm -hmm. i think the one toughness answers are better definitely yeah, yeah so i think ginger brute's gonna probably be you know it was about a c plus in original little drain i think you know all things considered there's different things you like about it here slowly but i i think i would just give it a c plus yeah I'm, I'm with you there great all right next up another old favorite prophetic prism two mana it's an artifact when it enters the battlefield, you draw a card, and one tap, you can add a mana of any color. So it filters your mana, just like every other Prophetic Prism you've ever casted. Yeah, and we've seen this card disappoint a little bit mm -hmm. multiple times recently, but they keep pulling us back <laughs> in and being like, well, maybe it's still good. And the reason they're going to do that this time is once you're done fixing your mana, this we still somehow haven't seen a bargain card, but this is something you can just throw away to your, your bargain spell laid on. Yeah, it's it's a card that I think for well, in some sets people would argue you could you could take it like you know between second and fifth sometimes and I imagine you're going to at some weak packs in this set too but uh, it's not the it's a glue card right it's not a card I think you should be taking early you're gonna know when you want it when you have your splashing or you know it's a it's a perfectly fine way to fix your mana too like in a in a more than two color deck you don't want to play this in just a two color deck to fix your mana it's just too high opportunity cost but uh, yeah you're gonna find some trinkety things i'm not gonna start it that high I, I think i'm gonna start this as like a c minus i think even considering bargain i think there's just like you said a ton of material just lying around the battlefield in the set so many things that make little things i don't think you're gonna have to put this card in your deck for that purpose you might have it in your deck for that purpose but you don't have to draft it highly for that purpose yeah i'm i'm gonna join you at c minus but this is it's closer to a d plus than, mm -hmm. than a c for me yeah, it's it's like a C minus when when you want it, which means you should draft it like a D, <laughs> basically. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, uh, th we'll see what uh, our good friend Lord Tupperware has to say about Prophetic Prism because I think he's he's more of a Prophetic Prism player than either uh, you or me. All right, and we got uh, a, another kind of a twist on an old friend here. We've got Scarecrow Guide. So this is two mana for artifact creature Scarecrow. It's a two one reach. And it's got uh, the, the Mana Worker ability. What, Salvage Mana Worker? Is that what it's called? From DMU 1, add a mana of any color. Activate this only once per turn. So it's, it's uh, you get to, once again, kind of filter your mana. This fixes your mana. And it's on a, not a terrible body, right? Two mana, two on reach. Yeah, and of course the Scarecrow has reach. It can, it can block Yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, yeah, but this is, I think, similar power level to Salvage Mana Worker, which is a card that I played more than i expected when it was spoiled yep so instead of dismissing this right away i'm going to expect to play this some amount of the time um but another one toughness card like but i'm just gonna keep pointing them out there's just tons of them out there this is the kind of card that you are going to want to play when you're in this situation that we were describing before where you have you've picked up a bunch of adventures and maybe you don't actually want to put an island in your deck but that blue black adventure is pretty good the, the, the black is the creature side and you're like hey i am my scarecrow guy you know you've got a few of those you wouldn't just put it in your deck for one of those but you've got three or four adventures that are kind of like that yeah then you're, you're gonna get some value when you your, your scarecrow will unlock a lot of your spells basically at, at a pretty low cost 
it was actually three cards that filter mana in this in this set. <laughs> At least three. There's three that I can think of. Right. So there's, there's quite a few of this type of effect. Yeah, kind of interesting. Um, so it's it kind of like Prophetic Prism in the sense that you're only going to want it sometimes. It's not a high pick. I think it's. I'm going to give it kind of a similar grade where it's like yeah, C minus when you when you want it, but you should draft it as a D. Yeah, and so if you have the choice at the end of the draft between putting Scarecrow Guide or putting Prism in your deck, yeah, what uh, which one do you go with? That's tough because uh, if this was just the one three like Salvage Mana Worker, with, I would say Salvage Mana Worker for sure. Um, but one toughness is a big deal here, right? like we've been talking about. Um, I I think I would still say the Scarecrow. It attacks blocks. It's just more modular, right? Even though there's some X one hate, like it's not it's not a huge deal. Um, so it's, it's got a marginally higher grade on it, but not one that I actually feel like I should bump it up anymore, you know? Yep. I, yeah, I totally agree with you there. I just thought it was worth mentioning that because we just saw the, uh, the two of them together. Yeah, totally. Uh, next up we've got, oh, a quick one here. Soul Guide Lantern, single mana for a uncommon artifact. When ETBs, you exile a card from a graveyard and then you can sack it, tap sack it, exile each opponent's graveyard, one tap sack, draw a card. This is a sideboard card for constructed. It's not a. It's not our card for us. Uh, it's well. I wouldn't even give it a sideboard grade. It's like you're not going to board it in in this set. Right? Oh no no no! I said sideboard card for constructed. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah, maybe I was a bit quiet on that part. And it doesn't even really like work with bargain because it doesn't draw a card. You have to like yeah it, yeah. Bird's gonna give us an F and save some time. Next yeah, if, the, if bro couldn't make it good, then it's not happening here. Yeah, and it was it was like a marginal playable there. We've got a weird yeah. one here. What's up next? Next is Collector's Vault. Uh, we're into... Oh, we, uh, sorry. The last one was... So we've reached the uncommons now. Just worth mentioning. Oh, yes, yes. Or the second uncommon now, so you won't see that many Soul Guide Lanterns, thankfully, <laughs> is Collector's Vault. Two mana artifact. And you can pay two and tap it to loot and create a treasure, treasure token. Excuse me. Looting yeah. being drawn to start a card. So when I first saw this card, as well, first thing I said was that's a weird card. Second thing I said was... Okay, I, I'm looking at the words, you know, and another thing I've been talking about in the podcast lately is evaluating the words versus the numbers on the card, what the actual effect is, and then looking at how much you're actually paying for it. And the effect, draw a card, discard a card, loot, make a treasure token, it's got some nice things going on there, right? Like, looting is never a bad thing, making treasure is good, this does, and, if you know, this gives you bargain fodder. I think the two and two is just, like, too much of a cost. I think this is one and one. It would actually be pretty good. I mean, it would kind of be busted because then you're paying zero. It's like a zero mana looter that makes a, a treasure. You probably couldn't cost it at that. But I, I think at this cost, it's just like, what what are you planning to do with this card? It's kind of my thought. Like, what, what where am I like, oh, this is where you want the collector's vault. I think the spot where I'd find this interesting is if the, ups, the upfront cost was like just zero. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would play that then. And then you pay two to like draw, discard, create a trade trade treasure. As is, I I want to give it an F. Yeah, and worth noting this. You know, when you create a treasure, it's not you're, it's effectively the two and tap is one, but you don't get the treasure. So it's like you know, kind of modular there. The the problem I have with this card, and I've seen some people make comparisons to Network Terminal from uh, from Neon Dynasty, which was a three mana mana rock that uh, you could also tap an artifact to loot. The difference with this card and that card is you're never up a resource uh, with this one, right? I mean, sorry, you're up, you're up treasure, so that's not necessarily true. But you're not up a permanent resource, like a mana. A, a, like it's almost like a land, right? This one you're kind of just like never actually gaining a tangible advantage unless you're doing some crazy thing with tokens ev or, or treasures every single turn. So I'm gonna start this enough. It's a tentative enough because it's like, oh, I, I see where this card goes now, and I'm, I'm sure well, some people will be experimenting with it. I, as it stands though, I, I will just join you with add enough here. But it's also just not a set where you're going to run out of stuff to do with your mana that quickly because there's so many adventure cards. Yeah. So you won't need to loot as often. Yeah, I, I just don't see it. Yeah, I, there, I think a, a really good way to put this is uh, Center in chat says, I wouldn't put this in my deck, but I think dismissing it as unplayable is risky. I think it's a pretty good <laughs> assessment, right? It's it's not a card you're going to be like, damn, but I think there's going to be some spot for it where you're like, okay, that makes sense. Um, once a format or something. <laughs> uh, next up, oh, we got a cool in here. Three bowls of porridge, two mana for an uncommon food, two and tap. Choose one that hasn't been chosen. And there's three modes here. The first one is three bowls of porridge deals two damage to target creature. Second one is tap target creature. The third one is sacrifice three bowls of porridge. You gain three life, so it's got the food ability. It's tempting, mm -hmm. but. 
Is it good? I don't think so. Can I just say how happy I am that we're not drafting Lord of the Rings or doing our Lord of the Rings set review where every single time one of us goes, that's tempting. You won't have to hit the drum hit. Like, that I'm cheating. <laughs> we actually can just say that word now without somebody, ourselves included, being like, oh, they said the thing. Um, but I should have used I, the word appetizing for this, right? Uh, appetizing. There you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't, that's, what, it's like oatmeal? Yeah, it's oatmeal. That makes sense. Um, oh, it's porridge. Duh. It says in the name. I, yeah, it's a strange card. I think the ideal with this, in my mind, is you do the things and then you sacrifice it to bargain, right? That's I think that's the joke here. But again, the rate on this for all these abilities, I don't think is quite there. No, this is another one where it feels like it's not quite enough, but you probably should be giving it enough just mm -hmm. to deter people. Because yeah. it's, yeah, because if, if you manage to do all three things, you spent eight mana to be able to <laughs> tap something in game three life yeah that is a lot the thing that i think you can kind of sort of argue uh, i'm not even gonna get to this argument because it's something i'm gonna say when we talk about bargain so I, I think that's the right baseline and yeah i think this is like a d minus d i'm gonna say d I, th I think this wouldn't be the most horrendous card in the right deck but uh not a card you should look to play okay i'm i'm gonna go f okay cool uh, oh, this is kind of a cool one. Uh, Ariette's area. I think it's it. Ariette's tempting apple. So this is four mana for a legendary food, <laughs> legendary food artifact. When it enters the battlefield, you gain control of target creature until end of turn. Untap that creature. It gains haste until end of turn. So you got a four mana active treason effect. It also has the food ability. Tap sack, you gain three. It also has two tap sack. Oh, sorry. Two tap sack, gain three. It also has two tap sack. Your opponent loses three life. Hmm. So we did yeah, mention this one. Nope. These artifacts are all weird. Yeah, trinkety. But this one's certainly better than the other ones, I think. I agree with that too. So let's just evaluate this as you're playing an aggressive deck. You don't have any sacrifice outlets. Yeah, I kind of don't even mind this as just you know four mana, steal their thing, and then you attack with it, and then th that three life loss that that matters for your aggressive deck. Like just that extra bolt to the face. Um, I think there's going to be sometimes. Yeah, you just sacrifice it for your bargain cards. I think this is actually a pretty solid card in your aggro decks. Yeah, the gain three is going to be less relevant because if you're playing this for a threaten, the life loss is going to almost always be the side you want to use. Right. But having it as an option is still nice. And there are a few ways. There's, we saw the red-black uh, adventure that was able to sacrifice a creature you steal. And then there's one of the cards on the bonus sheet too. So there are a couple ways to do the steel sack, even if it's all on the uncommon side. Yeah, it's it's pretty light on that. There's some sets that there's like, you know, seven sack outlets or something. This is not one of them. So you're not really evaluating it too much for that. Um, hmm. Yeah, this is, this is kind of a funky one. I want to give it a C in aggressive decks. Uh... Yeah, I think I could, I could, I could agree with that. Yeah, and, and I don't. I it's not. It's, it's not just like generically good fodder either, because you're just not gonna want to play this in your non-aggressive decks. So, yeah, just for the aggressive decks. So, uh, so join me there. See. Yeah, I'll join you with C. Cool. Let's do it. Next card we've got. Oh, it's your favorite. Crystal Grotto is back. <laughs> so Crystal Grotto is a land that when it ETBs, you scry one, and it taps for a colorless, and you can have. Once again, here's that another filter card. One tap, add a mana of any color. So it doesn't actually, you know, you're paying additional mana when you're splashing with this, but it does give you a mana of any color. And that's Scry 1. This is the part of the card that generally, uh, we this card was from DMU last time we saw it. And I remember you talked me up on this card. I was like, oh, no, like you don't, you never want to play this effect. And generally these cards are, are pretty poor, this kind of effect. DMU had some context of, again, there was like the off-color kicker you wanted to just, you know, put in your deck and just say, hey, I have a red kicker cross, I'll, I'll put a, a grotto or some other source in my deck. And uh, this set has the same thing, which is why I think it's here. But what you really turned me on to is the fact that, like, basically that combination of Scry 1 plus the filtering for opportunistic things is enough to push it over the edge where you are going to play this card sometimes. Yeah, this is, I don't know if I'm supposed to grade this for the public or for how I'm going to draft it, <laughs> but uh, I, I really like Crystal Grotto. And I actually, I said three ways to fix the filter mana. There's actually uh, four because there's the mana worker, the prism, the grotto, and then the two drop green creature as well. So there's tons of ways to filter mana, which maybe makes this less appealing, but I think this is better than most of the other ones. Well, I'm sure the people want to hear. Give us uh, your, your mark grade and your general grade. Um, well, I'm going to draft these as if they're 
D pluses because I'm never cutting them, but it's not a pull to anything for me. What was the most you played in Dom? It was like three, right? In one deck, and you, you thought you felt like that was too much. The most I played was four. <laughs> Holy, that's <laughs> too much. That's totally too much. <laughs> one is generally where you want to be. I know Mark Mark played like two sometimes, and it was you know I, th- I think it was, it's fine to do so. But if you're unconfident about where to play this, just just play the one when you've got a bunch of off color stuff, off color uh, adventures. So I I'm at the point where I think I would play one of these in a two color deck. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just with no no fixing, no splashes whatsoever. Yeah. And then if you're playing, yeah, like three, four, or five colors with all of your off-color adventure stuff or whatnot, um, the second one's good, but the third one hurts you more than it's worth, I think. Yeah, I, I'm going to join you there, and I, I will probably just join you with your population grade as well. All right. Cool. All right, next up on the list, uh, another old favorite, Evolving Wilds. Simple one. Sack Evolving Wilds, tap it, it's land, search your library for basic land, put it on the battlefield, tapped. Great. Another C plus. Just gonna be a C plus, yeah. And again, I think right. same. Uh, it's got the same role here as it did in uh, that we just talked about with the Crystal Grotto. It's just like, yeah, sometimes you're gonna have a bunch of blue adventures. Uh, next up, Edgewaltian. Wow, this this one. I, I had to read this twice when I first read it because I was like, whoa, they, they actually printed this card. Enters the battlefield tapped. As Edgewaltian enters the battlefield, you choose a color. You tap it to add a mana of the chosen color. So this is the uh, we've seen this from. What was the one from uh, Neo? Neo the. Uh, Haven, uh, Uncharted Haven or something. Yeah. Basically the same thing, right? It's functionally an evolving wild. You pick a color, but it's better. Well, a little bit better because you don't have to to put the basic in your deck. That's that's better than what evolving wilds does. Here, it just fixes you for any color. Okay, cool. But then, three, tap sack it, return target card that has an adventure from your graveyard to your hand. Wow. Yeah, so it's not only draw a card, it's like draw a, a card you want to draw. And it's like draw two cards <laughs> for if you're yeah uh, exactly if... yeah it's a card that's going to be good in the late game as long as you have an adventure to bring back from your graveyard. This card's excellent. This is just going to be one of the not the highest power level early picks, but it's just so flexible. You're all you're always going to play this card. It's going to be quite good. Like even from a power level perspective, I think it's quite strong as well. Um, you're not going to take it over a bomb or something. But if the pack is unexciting or maybe the best card is like yeah, okay, it's a fine card. You should take Edgewell in. Um, this is this is gonna be quite a high pick. So, what do you want to give this as a grade? I was honestly gonna give it a B. I, I think yeah, just like okay. yeah, I think you're gonna want the off color activation or like a two color deck is gonna want to play this like just like with the Grotto. You're gonna want to play in your two color deck and there's additional value because splashing has some merit in this set. So, just a B for Edgewell 